Welcome back. Uh, this is Olga Zaitseva again, talking about uh, a study of causal relationships between immunoglobulin G and glycosylation trace and 12 associated diseases. Olga, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, I would uh, like to thank the organizing committee for the opportunity to present my work. Uh, my project also belongs to the field of uh, lyconics. I'm going to present uh, a study of causal relationships uh, between human IgG and glycosylation traits and 12 associated diseases. And I'm uh, quite sure that the previous two talks gave an excellent uh, context and background for the field of glycogenetics. So I can um, switch uh, directly to business, so to say. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, uh, IgG, we know that uh, IgG, um, is one of the uh, most abundant antibodies found in the blood plasma of healthy humans. And it is also uh, uh, one of the most abundant and glycosylated proteins found in the blood plasma. And uh, these glycans are essential for the IgG functions because we know that um, <clears throat> uh, their structure actually affects the immune response. As Lucia mentioned in her talk uh, just, uh, just two talks ago, uh, the structure of this glycan uh, the addition of such uh, like uh, modifications which may or may not be present on the glycans, like um, modification with galactosis on the antenna of the young glycan, addition of uh, sialic acid, um, addition of corfucose or bisecting anglicnac, uh, might affect the interaction between the molecule of immunoglobulin and um, FC gamma receptors, which are found on the immune cells. And thus, it can direct uh, the immune response uh, versus um, it can direct the immune response to pro or anti-inflammatory pathway. And uh, modifications such as um, <clears throat> antennary galactosylation and especially antennary cellulation are supposed to be associated with more like anti-inflammatory and protective response. Addition of corfucose was shown to drastically reduce antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. So it is also one of the uh, anti-inflammatory modifications. Uh, however, bisection uh, is regarded, uh, it seems to be associated more with like pro-inflammatory profile. And uh, <clears throat> so we know that uh, IgG and glycans, are, uh, IgG and glycom in total is altered in many pathological states. For instance, uh, it changes in autoimmune diseases, in inflammatory diseases, it changes with aging. Um, but what we don't know is uh, whether those changes in the glycon are actually uh, the cause or consequence of some pathological processes in the organism. And since we in GANAS work a lot on the development of uh, N-glycan biomarkers of various pathologies, we would really like to answer this question about causality and learn more about the functional uh, meaning of all these glycan modifications. So um, <clears throat> classically, how would one address uh, this question of determining, uh, establishing causal relationships between two factors. So classically, the golden standard would be to conduct a randomized control trial. Uh, so uh, we are all familiar with this approach. You, you would recruit some subjects. We would separate them into groups randomly. Uh, some uh, One group will receive some intervention, some treatment. The other will not. And then this uh, randomized uh, assignment will um, uh, ensure the equality of confounders between the two groups. And then when we're comparing the outcomes between these two groups, we can attribute all the observed changes to the action of this uh, specific intervention. However, if uh, in our case, we would like to establish some causal link between a disease risk and uh, IgG and glycosylation, it is practically impossible to conduct such a, uh, such a randomized controlled trial. So uh, luckily for us, there exists an excellent in silico method, which allows to use the information of, uh, about how different mutations influence two complex traits uh, to establish this causal link between the two traits. So this method is called Mendelian randomization. And now I will try to explain in brief how it works and how it is similar to randomized controlled trial. So let's assume that uh, in, like in the framework of Mendelian randomization, the upstream trait, the one which is supposed to be the causal one is called exposure and uh, the downstream one is called outcome. Uh, so let's assume we would like to find out whether there is any uh, causal influence of uh, disease risk onto some IgG and glycan trait. Uh, so we would use this uh, assumption um, 
that in the populations, all the, all, all the alleles, mutations are segregated uh, randomly and independently. So then we can assign to one group all of the subjects from our population that uh, have in their genomes one or two copies of an allele that somehow enhances our exposure. For instance, uh, disease risk in this case. So uh, the other group would comprise uh, all the subjects who possess only the wild type alleles, which are not affecting the exposure. Uh, so um, then uh, this uh, random allocation of alleles would also ensure uh, the equality of confounders between the two groups. And again, we can go straight to comparing outcomes between these two groups and um, uh, all the changes, all the differences that we would see would be attributed to the uh, different um, different exposure in the two groups. Uh, but where from will, will we get this information about how different mutations influence uh, our complex traits? We should turn to genome-wide uh, uh, association studies, GVASES, because basically the output of every GVAS is a uh, summary statistic, which describes how uh, all these uh, genetic variants influence a certain trait. So in our case, uh, when we are talking about trying to see whether a disease risk has some influence on the angular causation of IgG. Uh, we don't, so we don't know what is this uh, causal link. We would like to establish it. We should start from a genome-wide association study on the exposure trait. Uh, so from this uh, GVAS, we can select uh, specific SNPs that uh, we know for sure uh, that affect the exposure. And basically, we will call in this framework of Mendelian randomization, these SNPs would be called instrumental variables. So uh, uh, this GVAS for the exposure trait will be able to provide us with information of how these SNPs influence the exposure, the disease risk. Then we would turn to the uh, GVAS for the outcome trait, so the downstream trait, and we will find in this GVAS exactly the same instrumental variables as we selected in the first step from the exposure GVAS. And when we look at what effect these uh, genetic variants have on the outcome now, we will uh, find out this uh, a third connection between these SNPs and the outcome trait. And then this basic triangulation rule will be um, helping us to find out the unknown connection between uh, the exposure and outcome. And uh, um, <clears throat> the directionality of uh, the influence is ensured by the fact that uh, genotype is always upstream from the phenotype. Uh, so, uh, however, for Mendelian randomization to work as it's supposed to, a few assumptions uh, and conditions have to be checked that concern our instrumental variables, our mutations that we are selecting for our analysis. First of all, these instrumental variables have to be associated with the exposure. And this may ensure by the selection of um, uh, replicated SNPs, replicated in few independent cohorts, so we are sure that they are have some impact on the exposure. Second uh, condition is that, uh, that uh, these instrumental variables shouldn't influence the outcome through some other pathway uh, not connected with the exposure. And this situation, if such an influence exists, is called horizontal pleiotropy. But uh, there are some statistical methods to get rid uh, of such SNPs, detect them, and exclude them from the analysis. And the third condition is that our instrumental variables shouldn't be associated with some common confounders for exposure and outcome. And this uh, assumption is actually the most complicated to verify, because in this case, we would need to check some previous studies and establish which confounders are similar between exposure and outcome. Uh, but uh, I have to confess that in this work, we still haven't checked uh, this uh, third assumption yet. Uh, because um, we had quite a bunch of anglocosylation traits and 12 diseases and all possible pairs. So we decided that we will go into more details and we will um, uh, confirm uh, this condition if we find some interesting um, hints of these causal links in the first uh, discovery scan. So uh, how do we represent the results of Mendelian randomization graphically? Uh, well, uh, we can take all of our instrumental variables, all of our genetic uh, variants, and we can plot them, them on this uh, uh, this graph. So on the x-axis, we will put the effect of each SNP on the exposure trait, on the y, the effect on the outcome. Then for each of these uh, dots, for each of these instruments, we can actually calculate the causal effect as simply as the effect on the outcome over the effect on the exposure. 
And then since like if we have a, a bunch of uh, instruments, we can also conduct meta-analysis. We can combine this data received from each of the individual instruments. For example, we can use inverse variance weighted. And so then we can uh, uh, produce a linear regression line. And the slope of this line will uh, tell us the magnitude and the sign of uh, the causal, uh, causal relationship between the two traits. And of course, uh, in this case, like the more instruments we have for calculation, the better it is because then we are able to uh, calculate this effect with more precision. And we can be more sure that we are uh, really indeed uh, see an existing effect. So now turning to our work, um, to repeat, we would like to connect uh, uh, causally, uh, IgG and glycosylation traits and uh, the risk of uh, a few diseases. So when I'm speaking about IgG and glycom, I am saying that we were measuring uh, up to 86 uh, glycosylation, IgG glycosylation traits. Uh, we're measuring them by uh, liquid chromatography and we used uh, GVAS summary statistics uh, like uh, performed in house. All of these cohorts were of European descent. Uh, when I'm talking about disease risk, uh, here we had to rely on publicly available data. So we selected the diseases for which we knew that IgG and glycom is changing in these diseases from our previous uh, high throughput glycomic studies. And also there should be publicly available a good, powerful GVAS summary statistics. So we selected a few autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, asthma, also inflammatory diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, a few cardiovascular diseases, type two diabetes, lung cancer, and uh, two neurodegenerative diseases. So we would like to check if there are any uh, causal links between IgG and glycans and these 12 diseases in any direction. So our first step was to treat IgG and glycan traits as exposure traits. And the first step is of course to select instrumental variables from the GVASs for the exposure traits. So we uh, <coughs> checked all of our uh, IgG glycans measured in a cohort of 9,000 people. And we selected uh, these GVASs which had at least two valid instruments. So some SNPs which were associated with IgG and glycans in previous studies and confirmed in the few independent cohorts. And we ended up with two to 13 instruments per GVAS, which is not as much to be honest. And we uh, selected 56 IgG glycosylation traits. Uh, then as outcome, we used the uh, publicly available data summary statistics for the risk of these 12 diseases. And then we performed the sample Mendelian randomization analysis uh, for all possible pairs of uh, 56 IgG and glycans and uh, 12 diseases. However, in the first step, we found no significant causal signals, which would surpass our significant threshold, which was defined based on the number of statistical tests performed. So here we were a bit uh, dissatisfied, um, so to say, but anyway, we moved to the next step when we were treating uh, now the disease risk and exposure. So here it was a bit easier um, like um, to select uh, uh, the instruments. We didn't do that uh, super wisely at this point. We were just scanning through all these 12 uh, GVASs for, for disease risk. And we were basically taking into analysis all independent SNPs, uh, which reached uh, uh, genome wide level, wide level of significance uh, in this uh, summary statistics. So we ended up with like way more um, um, instruments, I would say, for some of the GVSs, up to almost 200. And then uh, as outcome, we took uh, 86 IgG and glycosylation traits measured in 8,000 people. So uh, we, again, we performed uh, in the same way uh, Mendelian randomization for all possible pairs. And we found one uh, causal signal, which indeed passed uh, the significance threshold. And this signal was related to the effect of systemic lupus erythematous risk onto the bisection of IgG and glycans. Uh, and this uh, link was positive, meaning the uh, higher is your risk to develop lupus, the more bisected IgG and glycans will be present in your IgG and glycom. And when I'm talking about bisection, I'm talking about this specific feature. So a presence of this uh, bisecting and glycanac in between the two antennas. So modifications on the antennas can be uh, variable, so they might be something on the antennas, might be not. This scorficose also might be present, might not be present, but important is that uh, bisecting and glucnac is there. 
And we were really uh, inspired by this result because we know from previous studies of um, uh, IgG and glycom in lupus that people who are sick with lupus, they are differing from the healthy controls by uh, a relatively bigger abundance of uh, glycan structures, which are related to the abundance of bisectin and glutnac. So for instance, here we have two traits measured and both of these traits actually incorporate some uh, bisecting and glycans and they are all elevated in lupus patients. So uh, these results that we obtained here made biological sense. And then we decided to uh, do a few sensitivity analysis steps, uh, try to replicate this causal effect if we strengthen the conditions of our Mendelian randomization analysis. So first of all, we decided to refine our list of instrumental variables. So we took into our analysis uh, all the SNPs uh, from this publicly available discovery GIVAS summary statistics that were replicated in independent cohorts, removed pleiotropic SNPs, and removed the SNPs that were further uh, not confirmed to be replicated in any independent studies, even though they were genome-wide uh, significant in this uh, summary statistic that we used for the first round of analysis. We ended up again with 36 instruments, but those were different 36 instruments, I have to tell you. And to our um, happiness, we were able to see this effect almost of the same magnitude, uh, same direction. So replication went uh, really nicely. And then we decided to switch the outcome cohort and we took IgG um, and glycan bisection measured in the other independent European cohort. However, in this case, we lost this causal effect almost completely. So you can see here that uh, this uh, causal beta is now uh, close to zero and it's not significant at all. And you can also see it on the graphical representation. So you should follow this pale blue line representing the inverse variance weighted meta analysis. And you can see that in discovering sensitivity one around, uh, we can see a uh, similarity of uh, the um, uh, causal estimate while in the sensitivity two round this um, uh, estimate is lost. Olga, it is, it is time to wrap up. Uh, yes, and this is like basically the conclusion. So first of all, we couldn't find any reliable evidence of the causal effect of IgG and glycan traits on the risk of these 12 diseases that we were studying, possi possibly due to lower power of GVSS4 IgG glycan traits. So we couldn't obtain enough instruments to uh, prove the existence of this effect um, properly. And we found some limited evidence that increased risk of lupus leads to increased levels of bisection IgG and glycom, which is consistent with the fact that uh, bisecting um, is in elevated in a lot of inflammatory diseases, not only in lupus, also in IBD and some cancers. And since here, uh, bisection is uh, downstream from the disease risk, we would say it's not maybe a biomarker, but, uh, convenient, uh, in a, but not a convenient treatment target. And in the end, I would really like to thank all of my colleagues from Zagreb, from uh, University of Edinburgh, and especially from my alma maters of uh, Institute of Cytology and Genetics and Novosibirsk State University, and all the funding bodies who um, made this project possible and um, supported me. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we are out uh, of time. So uh, if there are any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat and uh, we will forward them to the uh, speakers. And uh, thanks very much again, Olga. Let us, uh, so we're writing a little bit late. Let us make a break shorter, perhaps like five minutes. Uh, and after that, we will start the next half of this section.